Hey everyone, I'm Taryn and I have a follow-up message to the last message that I posted entitled, Something is Coming. I woke up this morning to the sound of a matchstick being lit and then I was prompted to start writing and I'm going to share what I heard as I was listening to the Lord. But first, I want to start with prayer. Warfare is really high right now, and we need to call on the name of the Lord. Before we speak and do anything, we need to get behind the God who fights for us, who fights our battles with our spiritual armor on. So I'm going to pray. Heavenly Father, I come before you, King of Kings and Lord of the Lords. You promise, God, that your word will not return to you void, but will accomplish the purpose for which you have sent it. And so I ask, God, in the name of your Holy Son, Jesus Christ, that those who are listening to this message, God, will hear, Lord, with ears that hear. Lord, open the eyes of the blind and set captives free today. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Okay, this morning I woke up to a sound of a matchstick being lit and was prompted to start writing. Here is what I heard as I listened. No friction, no fire. God's love is abrasive to our sin because our sin hates us. And it wants to lead us on the path of the of destruction onto the wide path of destruction and to keep us from the narrow path of Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life and healing and wholeness. So God's love is abrasive to our sin because sin hates us. It's abrasive. God's love is abrasive to our flesh, which scripture says is at enmity with God. Hebrews 12 29 states that God is a consuming fire. He seeks to cleanse, us, to cleanse us of our impurities so that we can see him more clearly. Our sin is the veil between us and a holy God. Jesus Christ is the remover of the veil. Matthew 5, 8 reads, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. In the message I recorded earlier this week, Something is Coming, you can see that the Holy Spirit overcame me when I said the word torches. It was a message about the church, the worldly church and the religious church, both dim and devoid of God's power. See 2 Timothy 3, on the form of godliness that denies its power that we are warned about will increase during these times that we are in. The message was about empty lanterns. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid to strike the match of truth on the pride of the world if you are a follower of Jesus Christ. If we are going to be torchbearers for the gospel, we must obey the Lord. This is how we love him and how he loves us, with the truth. So we must cause people to stumble over Jesus Christ, who the Bible calls the rock of offense. We have a choice to make people feel comfortable, or we have a choice to obey Jesus and be a vessel of grace for people to stumble on. We must stop neatly smoothing and paving the wide path that leads to destruction for others. That's not God's grace. Our silence is a violent and destructive weapon in the hands of the enemy. How will anyone be confronted with the choice to follow the narrow way of life if we don't speak up? So we must speak up, but with the right perspective. We're about to enter a season where many are going to make politics their savior. Here is why politics are important and also how they can make us short-sighted. And we need to have sharpened discernment regarding this in the months ahead. Societally, historically, 
and demonically speaking, liberty and equality are polar opposites. Liberty and equality are not the same thing. Politicians say equality. Schools and government say equity. Then they exploit the areas and outcomes of people's trauma so that everybody just shouts hooray. But people don't think to distinguish the difference between equality and liberty. Propaganda counts on this in order to get people to do the work of tyranny. When they tout equality and justice, what many people hear is victim, oppressor, healing, and freedom from their pain. But they don't know that this is propaganda and that it just leads to more captivity that cannot be mended systematically or systemically or otherwise. I believe in treating one another with respect and equal dignity and value and love. I believe in making sacrifices for the good of another. And I believe in lifting others up. I believe in everything that Jesus taught and lived. But what is lately meant by equality is not this. Though people use a lot of very thin rhetoric to make us think so, especially if it gets the church on board. As if this next thing is just another humane and progressive step towards a compassionate and liberated society with no oppressors. And we do the same thing in our personal lives. We are always grabbing at some latest solution offered for our problems and for our desires. And Satan works this way. People are oppressed by pain because the world is sinful and we are sinful. Satan locates our traumas, which is not hard to do because he caused them in the first place. And he uses them to seduce us into even more captivity. And he says, make it trendy and appealing and loud to drown out opposition, even if it's just the person's own conscience. And definitely make it louder than the voice of the Lord who speaks, scripture says, in a whisper. Package tyranny in a way that exploits people's trauma and gives them a sense of purpose. Give them some hope. Make them feel good for a while. But the devil is a liar. This is the same old hook and bait of every sin. Theft, addiction, lust, drunkenness, witchcraft, the new age, religion, and more abominations to the Lord are outlined in the Bible by the God who made us and cares about us and loves us and wants to see us set free. His love lets us know through his word, the Bible, that we're screwed without the forgiveness and righteousness that Jesus freely offers to all, all who come. He freely offers it to all who come. All the ways that the world offers us out of pain and into glory warrant the death penalty by God. The only way out is through his son, Jesus Christ. No matter how stuck we feel in our sin, Jesus has the power to bail us out and give us something far better. No matter how far gone we are, no matter how evil the desires of our heart are, Jesus is the cure. He's the cure. God's perfect love offered to us through his son. He offers this to his creative beings created beings. And the trending chest beating equality is actually a devouring force of personal liberty because it demonizes righteousness. It's hypocrisy to say that people have the freedom to worship who or what they want to except for followers of Jesus Christ. Yet it's not followers of Jesus Christ that are oppressing people. It's sin. Christians are hated because people have this kind of neo-pagan uh, religious liturgy with signs and symbols and slogans, and they accuse those that don't serve their new and latest God, the enemy. People crucified Jesus because he came to speak the truth and it caused friction with the religious culture. The same thing will, will be aimed at Christians today from this religious world and its liturgies. 
We're on the same bus as we've always been on. And every stop is the same. Because we aren't in charge. God is. And he will make sure that we know. Then the choice to accept him or reject him is up to us. And we reap the consequences of what we sow. But God gave us the free will to choose life or death. But beneath votes and leaders and movements is the main tyrant. It's sin. And sin always leads to more tyranny, taking us further and further captive. More chains. More. 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 Every solution we think will free us becomes more chains. More bondage. Jesus is the only one who can emancipate us, heal us. And make us whole. That's it. That's the only way. Not equality, not even the illusion of personal liberty. Without Christ, we are all still slaves to sin and death and decay. Freedom and order from chaos without Christ is futile and illusory. So we must speak the truth. Scripture says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. God's love is abrasive because his son is abrasive. He is the word of God and the mirror by which we see our sin. The slogan, this modern slogan of preach the gospel and use words if necessary is for the lazy and the lukewarm. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's a slogan that does not reflect the life of Jesus Christ. Who said that we would be hated. But we don't want to be hated. So we don't speak the truth. And in doing that, we are being disobedient disciples if we claim to follow Jesus. And there's another lie um, that keeps people censoring themselves so that they're not sharing the fullness and the truth of the gospel and that is meet people where they're at where people are at is dead in their sins so the only loving thing to do is be honest is be honest and speak the truth in love and no matter what the fruit of honesty is going to be is going to be a cause for accusation people are going to call your honesty if you're preaching the real gospel the world is going to call your honesty oppression much of it will god will reap a harvest if you are faithful whether you see it this life or the next we're not responsible for monitoring the harvest we are responsible for faithfully sowing the seed of the word of the lord and leaving the rest to him his word says that we sow another person waters and God, God yields the production. He yields the growth. He makes it grow. We just have to obey him and speak the truth. So yes, like meet people where they're at. What people really mean when they say that, it's not what, they, what, what it sounds like. Um, Jesus absolutely met people where they're at. He came into the world as God incarnate through Christ Jesus in he, he, he came and he experienced what it's like to be human. That's an incredibly humbly thing to, humble thing for an almighty holy God to do, to enter the world as a baby. Yes, he met us where we, where we are at, but what people say, when people say meet people where they're at, what they're really saying is tread lightly, don't tell people the whole truth, or they might recoil from you. But that's not what God tells us to do. He tells us to speak the truth. And if people aren't made aware that we are dead in our sins and desperately in need of the Savior Jesus Christ, they're not going to come. It's very simple. So these are different forms of godliness that I see many professing Christians and churches practicing and teaching that completely denies the power of God. It's really, well, take Luke 8, 16 to 18, for instance. 
No one, after lighting a lamp, hides it under a jar or puts it under a bed, but puts it on a lampstand so that those who enter may see the light. For nothing is hidden that will not be disclosed, nor is anything secret that will not become known and come to light. Then pay attention how you listen. For to those who have, more will be given. And from those who do not have, even what they seem to have will be taken away. So we have a responsibility to pour out and to sow according to what the Lord tells us to do. And when we do that, he is faithful to multiply what it, he's faithful to multiply our wisdom, our understanding and our gifts as well, so that we could be even more fruitful. But if we're not, um, if we're not giving away the truth and the knowledge and the gifts that we have learned through the word of God, then we become kind of stagnant and our faith becomes swampy and not living rivers of water and life for those around us to come and drink from. And the world is thirsty and it's about to get even more thirsty. So strike the match. Strike the match that lights up the darkness and be the lighted city on a hill for the dark lost world in the name of Jesus. Do it with the words of your mouth if you have any love in your heart at all. And praise the Lord that the world hates you because you chose the door of faith and freedom in Jesus. Praise him if we are counted worthy to partake in his cup of suffering and persecution so that we may also partake in his glory. If you love Jesus, let him use you as a matchstick and speak life. Praise him for making you more like him if you are persecuted, when you are persecuted, because God promises when we do his work, we will be. And trust that his word will light fires of passion for him, because his word says that his word will not return to him void. No friction, no Holy Spirit fire. No friction, no impartation of life. God is, going to, God is going to allow the world to experience the friction of his indignation soon. And if God allows us to experience a tiny whiff of hell so that we are faced with the reality of hell in eternity and call on the name of the Lord and are saved, then that's his mercy. So we mustn't grumble when we're persecuted as followers of Christ, but instead be about the Lord's business understanding that he told us what would take place if we follow him. I love this quote by C.S. Lewis. Pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our consciences, but shouts in our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Kids are being heavily targeted regarding this through the media and the education system. A drag, a drag queen, excuse me, I'm gonna have a sip of water. A drag queen was just at our local middle school promoting this attention seeking, loudly celebrated lifestyle to kids who are mentally, emotionally, and psychologically suffering from the tyranny of the COVID years. <sighs> Programming is not new. It's not new at all. But the ideologies that are coming at our children are next level, predatorial. And the fact that it's ramping up when kids are vulnerable and struggling is no coincidence. This is a carefully cultivated scheme. Culture is indoctrinating children with confusing agendas that even secular psychologists are predicting will result in a mass suicide in 15 years. This is a carefully cultivated scheme, straight from the pit. Matthew 6, 23 says, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. And I included a link by a testimony of a testimony by Chloe Cole, a girl bravely sharing her story about what made her transition and why she's so angry about it. 
And then I included a video, I embedded a video that I was able to find on YouTube um, from Orwell's 1984, the, a scene from the movie that was made from the book. And, the, and it's called The um, Abolition of the Orgasm. And it's about uh, the tyrannical exploitation of sexuality in order to destroy the nuclear family, confuse people, castrate them, make them more easy to control because the family unit historically is always the enemy of tyranny because it's what makes us it's what makes a community strong why this heavy lgbtq gender dysphoria stuff is being heavily promoted and what actually has to do with tyranny um, and it just really connects the dots but domestic violence suicide drug abuse and crime are all up and there aren't enough counselors to see all of the kids that need help. Talking to my teachers, um, talking to my kids' teachers at their school about what these years have done to kids is devastating, and it's widespread. Kids are averaging at least one grade level behind. The principal at our kids' school asked kindergarten parents to please encourage our children and teach them how to play, teach five-year-olds how to play because they didn't know how to play anymore, they had forgotten, or they had never learned because their primary years of development are growing up in a time like this. Babies' speech is, is uh, delayed on average. The, the, the age at which kids are able to start talking and formulating words is way behind, and anxiety and depression is causing new behavior issues at school. And that, I mean, is it a surprise really? So if you know a teacher, and I used to be one, please give them some love. I was a public school teacher. I had a lot of love. I do, I still have a lot of love and appreciation for the public school system, but there's a lot going on in it that's really wicked right now. So the follow your heart and your truth lead to more bondage, not freedom. Because there's an enemy of our souls who wants to keep us dead in our sins. And the trauma of the past two years and its impact on families has primed kids for sexual grooming. A sterilized, disordered, confused, and emasculated society is easier for totalitarians to control. But it's all just satanic. Satan preys upon our sin and our brokenness. And this sinful world needs a savior because... Look at what it's doing. Look at what it's doing to kids. Look at this propaganda, for instance. You can look at the link in my blog post if you want. It's a, it's a healthcare for LGBTQ people. And I, I took a brief peek through, the web, through just their main page. And you, you will notice how they just make things like, take testosterone, pu puberty blockers. They, they brand it and advertise it like it's a beauty product. And this is how they get you. You think, oh, I, I might be LGBTQ or, you know, this is, this is for me. And the next thing you know, they're saying, let us sterilize and castrate you with surgeries and hormones to reduce the population and make it easier to control. So I have some resources in my blog post. My husband and I once contemplated how we saw the entertainment industry plant a false perspective in our minds and hearts from a young age, personally. And we began to make connections about secular entertainment's me-centric, follow-your-heart worldview and the entitlement and expectations that can sprout from them. We traced how certain feelings, choices, and beliefs created sin and tension in our lives against the life-giving Word of God, which says that the heart is deceitful above all things and deceptively wicked. Who can trust it? Jeremiah 17, 9 to 10. And we're not usually following our hearts anyway. We're following sin, the siren song of our trauma. Our hearts are broken. They lust after everything. And broken hearts can't fix broken hearts. And that's why we need to run to Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins and for healing and for wholeness because he gives us new hearts that want him and he gives us peace and joy and hope 
Acts 2.17, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. So I'd been recently asking God to speak to my children in their dreams. And my eight-year-old son approached me not long after telling me that he thinks he had a dream from the Lord because it was unlike any dream he's ever had and he felt God with him when he was in it. He told me that he was with his first grade public school class, the one we took him out of when it turned woke, which we had limited conversations with him about because he's too young. So he was with his class in the dream, but not at his public school. He was with his public school class, but not at the location of the public school. They were all at the church. And he said that all of the students were being hypnotized by differently striped flags which I showed him pictures of various flags on Google Images, and he pointed to the rainbow flag, the LGBTQ, like the pink and blue transgender or, or non-binary flag. They're, they're coming out with different flags every day. So it was all those flags, he said, and they just kept changing into different ones. And so I asked him, how could you tell that the kids were hypnotized? And he said, because they were just going around kind of doing their thing, but like in a trance, like, like they had no soul almost. And so I asked him when he had this dream. And he, he actually said it was, this was his answer. It was when there was basically a war, when the COVID rules were the strictest. I inquired, what do you mean by war? And he said, I just had a feeling in the dream that there was like a war going on, just like this feeling. Like I felt there was a war going on around COVID and stuff that others couldn't see. He said a man that looked like Justin Trudeau, which I believe just represents a politician, a very sleazy politician, spotted him and said, aha, the politician said, aha, and lunged towards my son in a dream and held up a flag in his face, like he was forcing him to stare at it. And my son said he felt his soul trying to get sucked out of his body, but he was able to dodge it because he said he felt like he had a superpower from God as he ran away. The lie that we prosper by being who we want to be is permeable and penetrating. Just like in the Garden of Eden, the lie is the same. You are your own God and you can judge what is right and what is wrong. In the words of the main character from Disney's Turning Red, Embrace your beast, aka feminist rage and carnality. Oh boy. Lord help us. There's a form of morality that is antichrist, ecumenical globalism, and personal salvation through rebellion. We cannot reinvent ourselves and expect trauma to suddenly fall off of us. Why would anyone follow their broken heart and mind when they could follow Jesus and be made whole and receive the mind of Christ? Because Satan deceives us and makes us believe that righteousness and holiness and God following Jesus is going to be boring. Oh my goodness, it could not be far from further from the truth. Sin and sin is sin is boring. Sin is redundant. Holiness is Oh, free, freedom, and it, it's exciting, and, and God leads us differently. Uh, it, anyway, a message, different message. Okay, so I'm grateful for Cooper's dream, because we never had a discussion with him about the brainwashing, considering he's, he's too young, he's too young for all of this, and little kids shouldn't be thinking about adult issues. They shouldn't be coming home and unable to sleep because their teachers are scaring them about global warming in order to get further cooperation from whatever it is that the government has up their sleeves next, you know, as a part of saving the world. So they say, um, they use fear. They use fear to get us on board with their programs with the promise that that fear will be alleviated. But it's not, it's just deception. My six-year-old, so that happened to my six-year-old. 
Um, my six-year-old doesn't need to be coming home from school either and saying things like, Mom, we learned about racism today. Racism. And that Martin Luther King got shot. Um, so my son's teacher in the same first grade class told the students to argue with their parents because at six years old, you can decide what's right and wrong based on what you feel. This was also when the classroom was planning a week-long celebration of LGBTQ Pride June, which in our community has been extended to July and now all year. Um, parents weren't allowed in the school because of the lockdowns, but my son told us that huge rainbow flags were everywhere, as well as the, you know, other kinds of flags that they keep inventing. We asked for a heads up on topics about gender, race, sex. We asked that, respectfully asked that from Cooper's public school teacher, from the principal as well, but we were told that they are too ingrained throughout the curriculum and whole day and that that's not possible. And no one was able to give us a reason. I tried to just have a conversation, but no one was able to give me a good reason why they wanted to tell our six-year-old about mature sexual topics. And it felt very predatorial. Speaking of predators, there's a link in my blog post of this message that includes Dr. Sid Gallagher advertising genital surgery to change the gender of kids. She's advertising it on TikTok. It's absolutely demented. Absolutely demented. So I believe the location of the public school kids at the church in my son's dream is a warning that this is infiltrating the church, not just the schools, because we can see that it is, and the true church will have nothing to do with it. Proverbs, Proverbs 4, 23 to 26 reads, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Give careful thought to the paths for your feet and be steadfast in all your ways. Do not swerve to the right or to the left. Turn your feet away from evil. So the eye is the lamp of the body. That's what Matthew 6, 22 says. The eye is the lamp of the, of the body. And you go to verse 23, it goes on to say, so if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? So we have to be vigilant about what we are subjecting our children's eyes and ears to. And my son was right. There is a spiritual war brewing. And we can read about it in Ephesians 6. The Lord's drawing us to vigilance. Let's praise him. Let's praise him that he has made us aware and is showing us what doors to close because his hand of protection is upon us and our kids. Let's be wise as serpents, as scripture calls us to do. And not dismiss the generosity and grace of the Lord who would warn us out of love like this through a dream to a child. He's so good. Oh, I could cry. Praise the Lord. First Peter 5, 8 reads, Be sober, vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So I was, I was, I decided to look up broadcasting, the word broadcasting, when I was writing this. I looked it up. Did you know that the word broadcasting means to scatter seed? We use it for like a television broadcast, but it's act or radio or media, but it means to scatter seed. So that's interesting because seeds represent the planting of beliefs in our hearts and minds, truths or deceptions, and they grow. Those seeds are planted, they can grow. They will grow, their seeds, depending on the kind of soil that they land on. This is very interesting to consider within the context of media consumption. Another link I included in my post is a cool article I found um, 
called the War of the Seeds, and it goes through how the Bible describes that. So our kids are surrounded by ideas that exalt themselves against the knowledge of Jesus Christ, things that look like light but are darkness. God's word gives life and exposes false light and keeps us on the narrow road with him. So the best way we can love people or the best way we can love our kids is by equipping them with the word of God and by daily covering them with the armor of God. Especially especially if we're in a position where we're not we're we're we're, we're not able to homeschool. If we have to send them into the public school, we need to cover them in prayer and with the word of God and by removing them from these influences just where we can even if it's just in our home and, and with the media choices. Because they're bombarded by this messaging if they're in the public school system often every day. Ephesians 6, 11 through 18. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness in this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Stand firm, stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And that includes on behalf of your children. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. The verse didn't say that includes children. I added that. Below are some videos uh, that I found since my son told me about his dream. You can see them in my blog post if you want. I don't necessarily take all the same stances and everything, nor if I watched through them all thoroughly. So just pray for discernment in all things because God is in control. Exodus 25 through six, you shall not bow down to them or worship them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. But showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. Praise God. Deuteronomy 6, 5 to 9. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your strength. Take to heart these words that I give you today. Repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you're at home or when you're away, when you lie down, and when you get up. Write them down and tie them around your wrist and wear them as headbands as a reminder. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. So let's saturate our children with God's word and let's saturate them with prayer and the armor in Ephesians 6. Wow, so many of the links that I posted, I'm just seeing now in my blog post have been removed because of censorship. Oh, praise the Lord. He will have the last laugh. All right, I'm going to pray to finish. Lord, thank you, God, for your promises. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die for the sin of the world. I pray, Lord, that if anyone listening to this has been living a lukewarm Christian life, that they will respond with a softened heart to your loving conviction. Oh, Lord, repentance is not to be feared, but embraced, because on the other side of it is more freedom and more joy. Thank you, Lord, for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to deliver us from the bondage of our sin. Thank you for your promise, Lord. 
your promise of justice, Lord, that you are a just God, Lord, and you will vindicate the righteous and you will judge the wicked. Thank you, God, that that's not our job, but that we can fully rely on you and trust on you, for you are just. Lord, have mercy, God. Have mercy on the children. Lord, your word says that the sins of the fathers and mothers will visit generations, even children, Lord. So I pray, God, that mothers and fathers will hear this message, Lord, and they'll turn to you. They'll turn to Jesus and be cleansed from their unrighteousness so that their children will be shown the love, the love and blessing and favor. Because we have loved you first. Lord God, I repent on behalf of my country. Lord, give us the boldness to speak the truth. Give us the boldness to hold up your son, Jesus Christ, to the world, even if it gets us thrown in jail or killed. I pray, Lord, that you would be the beating heart of every person, the true beating heart of every person that professes the name of Jesus Christ. And I thank you, Lord, that you promised that no weapon, no weapon formed against your church shall prosper. Thank you, God, that you give us the authority through Jesus to trample the heads of scorpions and serpents. Oh, Lord Jesus, we can do nothing without you. We can do nothing without your holiness. For we are dust here today and gone tomorrow. But who are we, Lord, that you have looked upon us with love and have sent us your son, Jesus? to offer us a way out into healing and wholeness and glory and eternal life. Lord, let this word go out across the nations in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for listening. God bless.